Eating disorders are a set of complex psychological conditions um, that involve uh, disordered behaviours around food and weight management. And this can include uh, things like self-starvation, binging, purging and over-exercising. They develop as a way of coping with emotional distress or as a symptom of underlying psychological issues. And although there, are, there isn't really one cause of eating disorders, what sometimes happens is that something that starts as a diet or as a health kick um, develops into a, a vicious cycle of compulsive and destructive behaviours around food that begins to control the person. Um, and the person's sense of self-esteem and competence and identity becomes totally entwined with their perception of their shape and weight and their perception of their ability to control their dietary intake. Um, and this then prevents the person from deriving satisfaction from other areas of their life, such as work or study or um, hobbies and interests and friendships and relationships. Alongside supporting the person psychologically, um, any effective treatment for eating disorders um, needs to involve targeting and changing the disordered eating behaviours themselves, as these disordered habits maintain the underlying fears and beliefs that drive the disorder and keep the person trapped. In the first part of the talk, then, I'm going to outline what are we trying to help people do in recovery? What does somebody need to do in order to normalise their eating patterns and break free of the hold that the dieting and the binging and the purging and the over-exercising has over them? And then my colleague Una is going to follow with ideas from for family and friends. How can, how can I support um, my loved one as they, are, they engage in the process of recovery? So... <coughs> There's four steps, really, that people in recovery need to go through in terms of breaking free from their eating disorder. And that's introducing regular meals, um, planning their meals in advance, starting to incorporate again into their, um, into their diets the foods that they've been avoiding, and then being able to, to eat socially and eat with other people again. So the first step to breaking free from an eating disorder is to introduce regular meals. So having breakfast, lunch, dinner and two snacks over the course of the day. Regular meals provide structure and control. So for somebody who's, who's tending to binge, regular eating reliably results in a reduction in the frequency of binges. And this is because it prevents low blood sugars in the body. Fasting for long periods or going for long periods without food, it lowers our blood sugars in our body and it sets us up to crave sugary foods or to crave a binge. So in recovery, we suggest to people that they don't go more than three or four hours during the day without having something to eat. Um, for people who have been eating very restrictively and are underweight, regular eating introduces meals that can be gradually increased in terms of size and nutritional content. When somebody's been eating very restrictively, what happens is their digestion slows down and when they do eat then, they feel full very prematurely after eating only a small amount, um, which can be a difficult obstacle to overcome in recovery when they really need to start increasing their intake and maybe restoring weight. Um, so regular eating, fortunately, rever reverses that process of what's called delayed gastric emptying. It reverses that and allows for the restoration of appetite again. What's really important when, when somebody is introducing regular eating initially is the pattern of meals rather than the content. So you're, you're just trying to get the regularity in place first. Um, trying to have something to eat at each meal, not skipping any, and then avoiding kind of eating in between times. The second and related step then is meal planning. So um, the person needs to prioritise their new eating plan and clear a bit of space and time in their routine for making changes, which is challenging. Um, so planning meals in, in advance is crucial. So the person should always know when and what they're next going to be eating. And there are two reasons for this. First of all, um, planning in advance gives you more control over what you're eating. And it also means that you're less preoccupied with food at other times. Um, and then secondly, if somebody is underweight, 
um, and eating very restrictively, um, that actually interferes with decision making and spontaneity. When we're underweight and undernourished, we're not really able to be spontaneous and, and make decisions. Um, so planning their meals in advance means that they're going to be more likely to make the recovery orientation choice at meal times. Um, person person in recovery they need to be wary of trusting sensations of hunger and fullness because these have been disrupted by the disordered way in which they've been eating so instead what they need to do is um, to plan to have average portions based on recipes or on the behavior of, fa- of healthy family and friends and to eat at, at typical meal times or when other people are eating rather than waiting until they feel hungry which is likely to be far too late um, changing your eating, changing disordered eating behaviour patterns in this way is difficult. So the person is going to need to have a think about and plan anxiety management techniques, distractions and supports. So this might include things like relaxation or mindfulness exercise, maybe planning some distracting and absorbing hobbies that you can engage in after meals. Um, Things like playing a musical instrument or crafts or things that you do with your hands or even that adult colouring that's very popular at the moment. Those sort of activities are quite good for kind of um, calming people and grounding people and distracting them if they're having a hard time managing their thoughts. Uh, Also, um, maybe getting out of the house, you know, going to a museum, taking the kids to the park, whatever you can do to try and make the changes and cope with... um, you know, the backlash that the eating disorder might present when you're doing that. Um, And also enlisting the support of family and friends, you know, arrange to see if you can spend time with people when you need to. Um, And also maybe you can you could use the the BodyWise support helpline, which is open for a couple of hours every day of the week. And you can check on their website, bodywise.ie, for information about when their support line is open. So once the person has established a a, a routine of structured regular meals and eating and begun to plan their meals, the next step is to start reintroducing avoided foods into the diet. So introducing avoided foods helps challenge fears and unrealistic beliefs about food. And the person can then discover that they can actually eat the feared foods in moderation um, without the, the consequences that they dreaded or imagined, for example, excessive and immediate weight gain or increased binging. Um, What's helpful is to try and make a list of the avoided foods and identify them. Um, And if if it is the person has been avoiding whole food groups like uh, carbohydrates or fats, a good place to start is to try and introduce some of those food groups into your main meals. So you're starting with improving the nutritional balance of your main meals. you can start with the foods that are the least anxiety provoking first. So for example, if you're trying to reintroduce carbohydrates into your main meals, you might want to start with brown rice or brown bread or something that doesn't doesn't feel too anxiety provoking. Um, And then you might build up to other things like mashed potatoes or chips that you might find a little bit more challenging. Um, And just gradually building your confidence and um, improving the nutritional balance of your meals. Uh, once you've improved the main meals then the person can work on adding in treats and dessert foods into their into their intake because those things are part of a balanced diet as well Um, and allowing ourselves sweet foods or treat foods in moderation reduces the likelihood that we're going to experience cravings and binges. The last step then is um, being being able and being comfortable with social eating again. So social eating um, presents a number of challenges for people with eating disorders. They might be anxious about eating in front of other people or eating in public. They might be concerned about the content of food. They haven't actually prepared the food, so they don't know the exact ingredients that are in it or the content of ingredients. Um, at things like buffets, you know, where you serve yourself, they might be unsure or confused about portion sizes or what to do. And then also often if, you know, especially in the evening time, if you go out for a meal, there's the custom of having several courses. So that can be very daunting for somebody with an eating disorder. 
So what's helpful is that if the person can be realistic about the stage of recovery that they're at and plan their challenges so they're kind of manageable and you're building building on your recovery gradually. Um, you might want to maybe start with eating with one or two people that you trust before moving on to a bigger group of friends. Uh, you might want to start with eating out for a, a light lunch or something and then moving on to a more evening meal. Um, planning in advance again is really helpful and uh, you can look up the menus online and pick a few choices that you think you would feel comfortable with and have yourself a little bit prepared um, and enlisting yourself a little supporter if you're going for if you know if you're going out with a few friends or to a bigger social meal or something that you have somebody that you can you know if you give them the nod they can give you a little bit of encouragement at the meal or if you need to go and get a bit of fresh air that they will come with you or whatever okay so th those are the kind of um practical steps the actual tasks that the person has to do to um, break free of the the destructive cycle of behaviors around food and weight um, often somebody with an eating disorder needs specialist support to do that and here at the hospital we offer outpatient a variety of outpatient and inpatient treatment programs that support the client the person to make these changes um, the uh, there are two uh, evidence-based treatments um, that are really part of our programs here um, and I'm just going to talk about some practical elements of two of them uh, that really help people make changes when they're in treatment with us. So the first is um, cognitive behavioural therapy for eating disorders. So this is uh, this has um, been developed by Professor Christopher Fairburn in Oxford University, and it's what it's what's called the gold standard treatment for eating disorders. So this means that it's been researched to be the most effective, to have the most positive outcomes. And what it involves is um, helping the person to change the disordered eating behaviours and to disprove the kind of faulty fears and beliefs and distortions that they have um, around food and weight and shape. Um, there's three, uh, three things about this treatment that really help the person in terms of making changes. The first thing is education. So in this treatment, we, we sit down with the person and we talk to them about all the ins and outs of food and weight and how our bodies work. And we talk to them about the effects of dieting and how fasting and dieting make it more likely that we're going to binge or about how <coughs> being underweight makes us depressed and irritable and preoccupied with food and obsessive and rigid and socially withdrawn. Um, because people sometimes, you know, when they're in the grip of the eating disorder, they think maybe that some of these difficulties, their depressed mood, their social withdrawal, they think maybe that's me, maybe that's my personality. But actually these are effects of being underweight, being undernourished and dieting, um, you know, that will resolve if your nutritional status has been resolved. So we talk to people about all these things. Um, we talk to people about what are normal weight fluctuations. So all of our weights, everybody um, at a stable weight, uh, our weight will kind of go up and down by a kilo or a couple of pounds from day to day, depending on you know, our digestion or you know, how hydrated our body is or whatever. And those are not really weight changes. They're just the kind of little, you know, uh, natural variations. But what's, what happens to people with eating disorders is that they weigh themselves frequently and get very anxious and very um, concerned about very insignificant changes. Um, so we, edu we educate them about this. And we talk to them, if, you know, if people are underweight, we talk to them about the weight restoration process what to expect, how it'll work, what you might need to do. Often when people come in to us, they think, oh, I'll start eating better than what I was eating before and my weight will fly up. <laughs> and that's not what happens at all. In fact, what happens is people discover it's actually more difficult than that. And although they, it might improve a little bit from being better hydrated and so on, that actually they need to kind of keep increasing their dietary intake as they go so that it's more than what your body needs to stay the same <laughs> it's it's to, to you know you need to keep adding a little bit as you go and um, so we, we kind of educate and prepare people for what to expect when they're making changes so they're not quite so blindsided and um, the second element of cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders is helping the person track their weight using a graph 
Um, so we encourage people not to weigh themselves at home, not to do it themselves, um, to get a, a healthcare professional or whoever's, uh, your therapist, whoever's providing your treatment to help you track your weight during using a graph. Because then you have the information against which to judge your changes. Okay, so if you're introducing more regular meals, then you can see what's, what knock-on effect has that had on my weight. Do you know, are things staying the same? Are they going up? They're going down. Um, and on a graph, it's much easier to see a trend rather than get zoned in on one particular increase or decrease, which is what happens when people are weighing themselves all the time, several times a day at home. Um, so, so we try and get them to use the support of a therapist to help them track their weight so that they can judge it objectively, you know, because often people think, oh, my weight's going up or it's going down or whatever. But actually what's happened is it's really the same if you plot it on a graph and you draw a straight line through it. Um, so that's a re another really um, helpful aspect of the cognitive behavioral therapy approach. And then the last bit uh, that, that's practical, that's really helpful, is we get the person to try and keep a diary of their what they're eating and also their thoughts and feelings and behaviours around it. And that helps people to gain insight and awareness over how the eating disorder is fooling them and how it has a hold on them um, and, and how they sometimes can trigger disordered eating behaviours um, mm. For example, through keeping a diary, somebody might discover, ah, every time I skip lunch, I end up losing control and binging and purging in the evening time. Or they might discover, ah, you know, every time I have an argument with somebody or I have that particular stress going on for me, I end up skipping a meal. Do you know, I don't eat well for that day or whatever. So it helps people to spot what their triggers are and then they can work with their therapist to develop an alternative plan of managing things. So that's the cognitive behavioural therapy for eating disorders, which is a big part of our programmes. And the other thing, uh, the other evidence-based intervention that's part of all of our out outpatient and inpatient treatment programmes is what's called a meal cookery group. Um, so this was developed by St. George's Eating Disorder Service in London and it involves the clients or the, the members of the group uh, preparing, cooking and eating a meal together weekly with practical hands-on support from staff. And the reason that this is so valuable is that it, it allows staff to walk people through it, to see the activity that they're struggling with live and help them adjust and adapt their behaviour, which sometimes people just aren't able to do on their own. Um, the first part of the intervention is a meal planning session. So, for example, on a, on a Wednesday morning in our inpatient program, uh, we meet together as a group and we decide, you know, what meal are we going to cook together at lunchtime on Friday? Uh, and we, th this gives the opportunity to kind of discuss and explore maybe unrealistic ideas or fears or beliefs about food um, and to challenge maybe distorted ideas. And the group has helped to plan a nutritionally balanced meal or a normal meal that they're going to cook together. Um, we use the session to try and help people connect with their motivations for recovery and to strengthen their intention to change. Um, and also the fact that it's a group task, you know, the group have to come up with a meal that they're all going to um, prepare and try together helps people develop flexibility and assertiveness skills. Um, then the next bit uh, for for members of the group that are far enough on in recovery, then they have the opportunity to go shopping to the supermarket and get the ingredients. So going shopping to the supermarket can be a really stressful experience for somebody with an eating disorder. They might find themselves agonizing over quantities of ingredients to buy or obsessively checking nutritional labels um, or getting in a dither or experiencing urges to binge while surrounded by so much food. Um, so it's very helpful to have the experience of going shopping, um, building your, your skills in terms of managing your anxiety, building your confidence. Um, so that, that's the shopping piece. And then on the Friday at lunchtime, the group um, comes together in the kitchen and prepares and cooks the meal together. And during this activity, lots of different um, disturbances in eating behaviours can be addressed and adapted and changed. And um, so things like um, people might often avoid preparing or being around food. Um, 
they might use inadequate quantities of ingredients. They might leave out certain ingredients entirely, like oils when cooking or whatever. Um, they might spend an inordinate amount of time preparing the meal or delaying the meal. Or they might serve themselves in like a, a too small a portion, an inadequate portion. So um, in this group, all of these things can be kind of explored and adapted and people can be supported to try and develop more healthy behaviours around food preparation. So the group then uh, sit and eat the meal together and the facilitators um, encourage normal social conversation and also ensure that the meal is completed within a, a boundary time frame, an appropriate time frame. And then after the, meal, after the meal is eaten, there's the opportunity for the members of the group to process the experience and talk about how they found it and how, how well they, th they thought they did in terms of um, cooking the meal and, and managing to eat it. Um, and they can give and receive feedback from each other, um, maybe gently encouraging each other to let go of some disordered behaviours, like maybe spending a lot of time cutting up food or... Um, using excessive seasoning and thing, you know, things like that. Um, and also, you know, to really support each other and, and give each other suggestions and reassurance in terms of moving forward with um, normalising one's eating behaviours. So just to recap, I suppose, in recovery... Um, alongside supporting the person psychologically and a lot of our program uh, works around uh, supporting the person to develop g good emotional regulation skills and positive self-esteem and um, good ways of expressing themselves but it's also you know the work of trying to normalize eating and the tasks that people need to do are introducing regular meals again planning their meals in advance introducing avoided foods and then getting comfortable with social eating again. And just to highlight that effective treatment for eating disorders does need to target behaviour change. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Una who's going to talk about how um, family and friends can support the person. Um, this evening I'm going to talk about some practical ways that can help and support families and friends in supporting their loved ones through an eating disorder. Supporting families and parents is one of the key aspects of the work we do here at the Eating Disorder Recovery Centre and our experience has shown that a person rarely recovers in isolation. The recovery process is something that often a whole family experience and it is well recognised that family and friends can play an important role in the recovery of an eating disorder. The level of involvement and intervention from family and friends can vary from individual to individual and can depend on a number of factors such, like, such as the person's age, the degree to which their health is compromised as a result of the eating disorder and other factors such as living arrangements and meal support. When somebody we care about is in distress and suffering from an eating disorder, it's natural to want to help and make them feel better. However, it's not always easy to know the best way. Eating disorders are complex conditions and family and friends can often feel <coughs> lost as how to provide the best support. So this evening I'm going to concentrate on two key aspects in guiding that support. Firstly, I'm going to look at how family and friends can provide support for their loved ones to an eating disorder and also how family and friends can provide support for themselves. So firstly, in lending support to your loved ones to an eating disorder, <coughs> where to start? And I suppose a good starting point is having that delicate conversation with the person and communicating your concern. If you do believe your loved one has an eating disorder, do gently try and communicate your concern and describe specifically what it is that you've observed to cause that concern. By having this conversation, you're creating an opportunity for the person to acknowledge a problem. It is important to accept, however, the person themselves firstly needs to acknowledge there is a problem and ultimately they must make the decision to move towards recovery and make change. The decision to move towards recovery is a difficult one, however it will be made more easier knowing that they have your support. If in the case your approach and your concern is met with some resistance and denial, try not to be disheartened, do try to be patient, do be be prepared to revisit the conversation and let the person know you're available to discuss the conversation further. 
leaving some information, written information for the person to read maybe in their own spare time and that um, may be helpful for them to get their head around the idea, leaving the information about eating disorders and the help that is available can be helpful until they come to that decision. Another helpful activity is to inform yourself. Learning as much as you can about eating disorders not only helps you increase your capacity for empathy, but also to, under, to increase your overall understanding of eating disorders. Understanding eating disorders means understanding that it is more about feelings than food. While food, weight and body image do play part of the picture, showing that you understand that something else is troubling them can be hugely reassuring for them. When a person has an eating disorder, Moving towards recovery can be terrifying for them. The thought of living without an eating disorder can really interrupt somebody, with, disturb somebody. It can be helpful to understand that an eating disorder can be a coping mechanism for somebody. It can help them make them feel that they're coping with things. If you're able to acknowledge the purpose of the eating disorder, serving for the purpose, you may be better able to understand why the person may want to maintain it. Accepting change will not happen overnight. Just like it takes time to develop an eating disorder, similarly, it takes time to overcome it. The first few steps of a person's journey on recovery will take place in the person's own time and own space. For you, this may be increasingly frustrating. However, they will need you to make time and room for their fear, their resistance and their uncertainties. During this time, the person is unwell. They don't want to be unwell. However, they lack the ability to overcome the disorder quickly. It is important to be mindful that there is no specific time frame for recovery. Understanding progress will be gradual and will include setbacks is a valuable part of the recovery process. A lapse in progress and a relapse in recovery is extremely common. And when this occurs for the person, it can indicate sometimes <coughs> that additional supports may be required and more effective coping mechanisms may need to be explored. Having this conversation with the person and talking about the best way forward can be very helpful in preventing further relapse in the disorder. Separate the person from the disorder. Try to be mindful that the person's behaviour is often a symptom of the disorder rather than a reflection of the character. No matter what eating behaviour a person is engaging in, Changes will occur in their body, in the way they think, in the way they behave, and the way they relate to people. Relating to them can become extremely difficult, and you may feel confused, you may feel angry, you may feel helpless, and you may feel exhausted. Accepting these feelings in yourself and trying not to blame the person with the disorder is one of the most helpful things you can do in offering your support. Accept limitations in your own responsibility. While encouragement and support is vital in encouraging the person on the recovery, it is the person with the eating disorder's responsibility to make the necessary changes and to move towards recovery. And finally, do communicate a belief that recovery is possible and a belief in the person's ability to recover. Often a person lacks belief in their ability to recover. Knowing that somebody is believing them in them and is a constant source of reassurance and support can strengthen their resolve. Holding hope for somebody until they're able to hold it for themselves can be extremely important and encouraging during the person's journey of recovery. So to recap, on what can be helpful in lending support. Do try and negotiate a way forward together. At the same time, be mindful that you're serving as a supporter and not a fixer. Do ask the person what they need from you to reduce stresses that they are experiencing. If they're unable to identify what they need, then suggest what you believe might be helpful. But be sure to check with them that they feel what you're suggesting is either making it easier or harder on them and to, 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 to check that out. Do focus more on how the person is feeling rather than what they are doing. Do communicate an understanding that food, weight and body image are only part of the picture. 
do communicate an appreciation of the energy it takes to struggle with an eating disorder. Do remain mindful that the experience of living with and recovering from an eating disorder is different for every individual. Do be honest about your own limits and do communicate a belief that recovery is possible and a belief in their ability to recover. And so while I've emphasised some really important points about supporting loved one through an eating disorder, I also will emphasise the importance of supporting yourself. The experience of supporting um, somebody else through an eating disorder can take a significant toll on family and friends. <coughs> It's important to acknowledge your own needs of support during this time and to identify support mechanisms for yourself. This involves not only identifying a need for information and practical know-how, but also to find a supportive space. A space where you can talk, to let go, to feel angry, to be afraid and to feel hopeful. By doing this, this will help you sustain you during your journey of supporting the person and help you in your ongoing support for the person. Identifying your own needs and putting your own needs not only models healthy behaviour, but will also sustain you. Some support links that I've identified is BodyWise, which is our national um, voluntary support um, association, the Voluntary Eating Disorder Association of Ireland, where it supports provide support not only for individuals suffering from eating disorders but also those supporting um, those going through it. There's two groups available, support groups, and one is for families. Um, so as Jane mentioned, if you log onto their website, you'll get a lot of information that you need. Also, our own website here at St. John of God um, is, a, is a source of information. Um, and also for those that are participating in our programmes here, there is family support offered and available. So I hope that's been helpful and informative for you and I'll hand you now back to Dr Larkin. Thank you. There were a number of questions about what programmes are on offer within the, um, the, the hospital and there are details about our programmes up on the website of the hospital. Uh, but essentially, you know, there are a number of options in terms of intensity of treatment from the from a one afternoon a week um, program to what we call the day hospital program, which is five days a week in in the hospital coming in each day, and an inpatient program which is residential um, within the hospital. It is also possible to have individual uh, CBT sessions as well within the hospital if people aren't in a position to commit to, to, a, to a, um, the kind of time involved. The difficulty with all the programs is that, again, as was said earlier in the program, people have to be at a point, if you like, of having decided, A, that they have an eating disorder, B, that this eating disorder is causing them more trouble in their life than it is being helpful to them and therefore they're looking for solutions and I suppose all programs work on the basis of providing a way to achieve the goal of, of recovery. There are also some questions about weight loss and no, not everybody who loses weight, there are many reasons why someone might lose weight, it doesn't mean that there's an eating disorder. Um, the weight loss is a result of a decision on the part of of the person that somehow pursuing weight loss or changing body shape, body image will in some way be the answer to whatever the challenge is in their life at that particular time. So it's not about weight loss, it's about what's motivated the person to pursue that as a solution to a situation or a challenge that they find themselves in. So we're going to rotate the questions, um, so I'll hand over to my colleagues to to address some of the other questions. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start. Is this one? Okay, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to start. Uh, there's a question here. How do you get them to chat about how they're feeling? Um, I suppose what I would suggest and advise is that you use I statements. So you might start a conversation by saying, 
I've noticed, you know, that you're looking tired or that you seem to be in bad form or whatever the observation is, but by using the I statements, rather than saying you seem, because it's a, it sounds a bit accusatory, and I think I statements are a little bit more welcoming and they, they, they welcome maybe a, a response that is less defensive. Um, <coughs> Also, just maybe by asking them, you know, things like if, if the if the if there's an eating disorder that that the problem if the, the person is admitting to the problem, then maybe ask them what it's like. What is it like to have an eating disorder? Just open-ended questions so that they can <coughs> explain maybe you know what how they're feeling and, and what's going on for them at the moment. So one point I would just um, emphasize is is to use the I statements mm -hmm. when you're when you're having a conversation with the person. Okay, hi. Um, I have two related questions here. Um, one is to what extent do you believe that celebrities influence young people around body image and what can you do to address this? Um, and two, in a school context, if you're working with teenagers, is there anything practical you could do to support them? Um, for example, if they have disclosed to you that they have an eating disorder. So I suppose, I, I, I think that celebrities influence young people around body image. Um, I think photoshopping and the media certainly doesn't help as it feeds into a very unrealistic ideal around body image. Um, and I think moreover actually uh, the culture of the selfie is actually even more unhelpful because actually young people and ourselves are all comparing our own best ideal side photo <laughs> to each other or looking at our own um, <laughs> holiday photos and assuming everybody is having an amazing time and is blissfully happy <laughs> and that's what's kind of projected on Facebook but um, what can we do to address this um, I think really and, and Bodywise is working very hard on this I think really getting education into schools and Bodywise has uh, um, developed a pilot program around educating young people as part of the school curriculum um, around body image and um, around you know healthy weight healthy body image and um, photoshopping how that works helping young people get media savvy and um, so that they know what's realistic and, and, and what's doctored and so on and so forth and um, supporting people to young people to develop self-esteem that's based on much more than just what they look what they look like and I think that's that's how, how we need to address that at a very grass grassroots preventative level, you know, before people are before kids are even developing eating disorders. Um, and then if a teenager has disclosed to you that they have an eating disorder, um, I suppose be there for them and see if you can't encourage them to speak to their parents, to seek the support and their the advice of their GP. Um, Bodywise.ie again has super resources in terms of leaflets and brochures about how to talk to somebody and also about all the treatment options that are available for young people and adults. So that's a really good kind of initial port of call if you're looking to know what to do. Okay, um, there was also a question about whether there are biological, genetic or neurological factors involved in developing an eating disorder. Well. On the one hand, there is no specific cause for an eating disorder. On the other hand, all of these factors, along with social, psychological, personality traits, all of these things increase your risk of developing an eating disorder if you have a certain profile. Um, but th that's no different to any other physical illness these days. We all know that we're all born with certain genetic vulnerability to different disorders but the same would be true for addictions but in terms of which people growing up in the same environment with the same uh, physical and biological um, makeup why do some develop an eating disorder and some do not well that's like asking why do some people develop cancer or whatever and some don't yes there is a biological side also when the disorder develops itself as Jane was saying one of the greatest obstacles to recovery is the effects of starvation itself or say the physical effects of purging of repeatedly purging the food that you eat and how that changes your whole metabolism and your fluid and electrolyte balance which again affects how you physically function 
but your brain is also, and your mind is part of your physical self as well, so it gets um, effect, affected as well. So the condition itself creates biological factors that make it more difficult. Jane was also talking about the difficulty when somebody hasn't been eating, if you like, a normal intake of nutrition every day, that the whole physiology of the stomach and how it empties begins to change and begins to slow down, which gives a terrible feeling of fullness after eating very little food. And again, that's a biological system that takes time to reset itself. It will only reset itself if the person persists with trying to feed themselves normally or adequately, it's a better word than normally, adequately, and it will come right in time. But we also know that, you know, issues of personality, of the social cultural um, background of the person, eating disorders, are rising in the developing world as the socioeconomic wealth of the of, of developing countries increases. So where there's a shortage of food, eating disorders aren't so prevalent. Where there's an abundance of food, it's the ability, it's the it's the response of not eating that becomes part of the pathology of the eating disorder. So, as I think it was both Una and, and Jane said, they're highly complex disorders, and to try and identify a single cause misses the point. But the other factor that I think we say all the time, because it's probably the most frequently asked questions by families and parents, what caused this in our family member? And the reality is, even if we could name a single cause, it would not change the disorder. It's a bit like addiction. It, whatever brought the person into it, knowing that doesn't necessarily break the whole cycle of the, of the disorder. So, yes, all those things, biology, genetics, all of those, the way the mind functions, the way the body functions, all of those are part of the eating disorder, but they're not the only thing that causes it. Okay, so moving on to our next question. Does somebody with an eating disorder ever fully recover? And the answer is yes. Um, for the person with the eating disorder, I suppose recovery involves commitment and courage. Um, it involves a will to change, it involves an acknowledgement of the problem, and then, obviously then, dealing with the physical and the psychological aspects of the eating disorder. Research has showed that a third of people do go on to recover, a third go on to live with the disorder, um, and unfortunately a third um, die from the disorder. It's one of the highest mortality rates of um, mental illness. Uh, related to this question is, um, do, they, do they ever uh, eat without guilt? And yes, so when dealing with the psychological aspects of the disorder, people learn how to deal with emotions more effectively and um, develop and adapt more effective coping mechanisms um, to deal with emotions. So yes, they are able to eat normally without extreme um, negative emotions such as guilt and, stuff and so on. Okay, um, I've Two questions here um, that are kind of related, I suppose. Do you, do you treat anorexia, bulimia, and binging in the same way? Um, so there's a variety of sorts of eating disorders. Um, some of the behaviours might be different, but the core pathology is, is similar or the same, in that what, what happens is the person comes to overvalue their control of their shape and their weight and their dietary intake to the exclusion of other aspects of their identity and their personality. So that kind of core thinking process is the bit that really needs to be kind of treated and dismantled, if you see what I mean. And all of the different eating disorders need to, you know, need to learn how to eat regularly and safely and normally again. Um, and the cognitive behavioural therapy for eating disorders is, is transdiagnostic, so it's the same treatment for um, for, for, or for the whole spectrum of disorders. And then somebody has said, can you not recover from an eating disorder by treating the emotions? Is it only if you change your behavior first? Um, so I, I think this is a really good question actually. Sometimes people need um, some therapy to get themselves to a point where they're able to understand and be ready and be motivated to make the changes. 
There's a particular form of psychotherapy called motivational interviewing that we use here in the hospital when we're meeting somebody or assessing them and getting them ready to come and join a program and make changes to their eating behaviours. Um, certainly people can develop uh, be better ways of managing their emotions and begin to build assertiveness skills and um, self-soothing skills and ways to relax and so on. But I suppose in, in some ways it's not until they let go of some of the eating disorder behaviours that their new skills have a chance to strengthen them. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so uh, <coughs> yes and no, I suppose, is the answer. The two have to happen together. I mean, to follow on on that, uh, Jane, I mean, I, I think we realise that whether it's bulimia or whether it's anorexia, which again, nowadays, as Jane says, we're making less of a black and white distinction between, because often they overlap or one develops into the other, or there are elements of both disorders in the person's repertoire of behaviours associated with the disorder. But one thing for certain is that recovery is a much better chance if the person and learn again how to eat adequately and, ex and keep the food. Mm -hmm. And the single most effective way of reducing the frequency of binge eating is for a person to eat regularly, mm -hmm. to eat meals regularly, because they're caught in a cycle of not eating regularly because they have binged and purged. And then hunger sets up you for another strong urge to binge again. So. Whether it's bulimia, whether it's anorexia, the relearning of how to feed yourself, of how to take adequate nutrition on a regular basis that doesn't fluctuate depending on whether it's a good day or a bad day, it doesn't fluctuate if things are going well for you or not going well, that you separate the task that every living organism has of every day providing nutrition to keep your systems working adequately. And, and once, the, the, once the person is able to do that and separate that task out from dealing with what other issues there are in their life, whether it's relationship issues or emotional difficulties or their own frustration with their lack of progress or success or their own frustration with not achieving the perfection that so often uh, people who have who develop anorexia pursue a level of absolute ideal perfection not just in relation to weight and to appearance, but also in relation to other aspects of their life as well. But either way, relearning how to feed oneself is a major step forward towards recovery, with no matter what type of eating disorder you have. Okay, the uh, next question is, my sister is very, very thin. She thinks she's overweight, eats very little, doesn't binge or purge. I find it hard not to comment what to do. Um, I suppose, first of all, um, I would say and encourage maybe not to use food and weight as the only criteria in, in your assessment of whether someone may or may not have an eating disorder. It's important to take a full view of how the, per the person is functioning. Um, if you see changes in mood, in social interaction, um, in their interests, um, and their physical um, well-being, you know, maybe showing tiredness and concentration. There are other, there are other um, elements and guideposts um, to assess whether the person has a problem. But again, as, as I said in my talk, if you are concerned, do, do try and gently approach the person, um, express your concern, and again, try to describe specifically what you've observed to cause that concern. Um, Again, if if they if it's met with reluctance and resistance, do try and um, use the websites and the information that we've given tonight to get some information and maybe to try and um, leave it for them to, to read in their own time. And, and please. Okay, uh, do you have any advice on how to cope with the need to purge after eating a normal meal, not a binge? So, so that, that happens and it is, is a variety of, um, it's part of the spectrum of eating disorders. I suppose um, how to cope with the need to purge after eating meals is, is making a decision that you're going to try to stop that and then to plan to keep yourself um, quite busy and distracted and supported after meals. And um, so what, what we suggest to people up on the pro you know that are doing the program here with us, you know, 
spend time in the lounge, spend time with other people. Go and talk to other people. If you feel very strong urges, go and get one of the members of the nursing staff. Um, can you do something pleasant and distracting? Um, sometimes people find uh, colouring or doing a puzzle or doing a crossword or if you do something like play the guitar or doing something very <coughs> practical with your hands can be quite helpful for distracting yourself. Um, mindfulness strategies and being able to kind of um, develop a little bit of tolerance for uncomfortable feelings and being able to ride them out a little bit is also kind of helpful. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a question about whether somebody reaching a near-death experience as a result of an eating disorder would change their outlook afterwards. Well, I think that brings up the whole issue of what will lead a particular individual for, if you like the old phrase, for the penny to drop, for the person to reach that point where they decide, I am now want this eating disorder out of my life. How do I go about it? And I think sometimes that could be that somebody develops a very serious complication from their eating disorder, whether it's bulimia or anorexia, and that suddenly attacks the denial that is so much part of these disorders. And, and anybody who is dealing with an eating disorder in a family realize how powerful that denial is, uh, that everybody can see that there's a problem, but the person themselves is still saying there isn't, I'm in control of this, I'm managing it. And in that way, it's not a whole lot different to, say, addictions as well. Other people realize there's a problem before the person themselves is, are able to say, yes, I have a problem with this and I want to find a solution to it. I think, I, I think what Jane was saying about motivational work is a lot of what we do because the denial is so powerful that we spend a lot of time helping the person to identify what is the price being to using the eating disorder to manage their life. What is the downside being? What what is the damage being to their life? But it takes a lot of time for people to be able to acknowledge the, the negative consequences for themselves of the eating disorder. Everybody else is telling them they have a problem that's very negative and they need to get rid of it. But that's not a great motivator. It's when the person begins to do the balance sheet and sees, since I've started on this road of the eating disorder, my life, I've lost this, I have more isolated, I've lost friends, I can't work, I can't study, um, and it's been able to overcome the denial around that, that uh, up to that point the person has just continued saying, I'm fine, I'm in control of this, this is what I want to do, it's not a problem. So again, I think for people who are trying to, to support somebody, helping them to identify what has the price been, but also what the positive effects are, because only when they are willing to give up what they believe, and maybe even in reality, the eating disorder has been of help in some way, but it's when they balance it against what the price has been. It's too high a price, and it's not the only way you could achieve the positive things that the eating disorder can provide. Uh, my next question actually, um is a, a lot um, related to what Dr. Larkin has just said there. Um, have you any suggestions to help a person who knows they have a disorder to want to change? In our case, there is an awareness of an issue, but too much despair, fear, or will to change. Um, and just to add on to what Dr. Larkin um, said, uh, yes, it's, it is about doing the pros and cons. Um, and if you don't feel that you know, you're in the position to to go through that with them then i would suggest that then they you know you suggest that they see a professional to do some motivational interview um, and to, to do the balance sheet about the, the price they're paying um to maintain the reading disorder um so yeah that's what to do um there's a question here about how not to get drawn into media attention on good and bad foods um, I think this is a really important question because it does seem relentless, the amount of advice um, and different angles that we're constantly bombarded with in terms of 
um, you know, what we should be doing about our diet um, or what we should be eating. I suppose with anything that we're concerned about ourselves, um, I suppose we need to recognise what's helpful information and what's not helpful for information for us to have. Um, so it's a bit like, you know, when there's something wrong with us and we go on Dr. Google and we get this plethora of information and we can get completely overloaded. And um, so I suppose it's about trying to kind of um, screen that onslaught of information and see if we can't reduce our exposure to it a little bit. Um, and maybe to try and seek support from your GP or whoever about, you know, what is the correct nutritional information? What should I really be looking to eat? Um, you know, you can, you can judge that as well, but, you know, based on your BMI and stuff like that. Um, and, and then to try and kind of stick with that and to try and limit your exposure to lots of other different things. Do you know, because you, you could read all manner of things. There's another question about whether there are medications that are used for treating disorders. Well, in general, not really. Um, the only evidence for using medication in treatment of eating disorders would be in relation to bulimia and using one of the antidepressants called fluoxetine, which is otherwise known as Prozac. Um, studies have shown that it decreases the frequency of binge, binging. However, that's not the same as recovery from bulimia. But it can be an important way of breaking into the vicious cycle and to the person's own lack of belief that they can do anything about this episodic loss of control that's involved in, in binge eating. But that is the only medication that has specific evidence in terms of trials and drug trials to support its use. Now we do use on the program sometimes other medications to manage anxiety, particularly in the early stages of treatment. The target there isn't the eating disorder, the target there is what we refer to as the backlash in the person to actually attempting to turn around and change the eating behaviours. And the enormous fear and sense of loss of control and uh, concern that they are somehow giving in causes such a level of distress that makes it very difficult for them to implement the kind of behavioral changes that we've been talking about tonight and something that can modify those anxious or anxiety reactions can help a person sometimes over that line to at least try a new food to try and eat increase the quantity of their food at a meal and sit with the food afterwards because it's not enough to eat it you also have to be able to hold on to it if it's going to actually change the nutritional balance that's making you mentally and, and physically not function at your optimal best. But in terms of generally medications, as I say, the only established evidence is for the use of fluoxetine in bulimia. But all it does is reduce the frequency of binging, which is not the same as recovery. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One or two. Yes, yes, yeah, no, no, okay. no, 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 no,
Somebody asked, nausea seems to be an issue for some or many individuals who start on a nutrition or eating plan. Can you give a little time to this in terms of how to deal with it? Um, I, I guess nausea can be your digestive system getting used to being in operation again. Um, it can be the reversal of the delayed gastric emptying that we were talking about. It can also be the anxiety as well. And um, so I suppose it's building things up gradually, introducing regular eating, having little and often to begin with, um, and then having, um, you know, practicing relaxation strategies can help, um, especially if it's very anxiety driven, um, and then having kind of ways or activities that you can use to try and distract yourself for a little bit while you kind of ride it out. Um, and then, uh, does the preoccupation and obsession with food ever end? Yes, if you normalize your eating patterns and, and achieve recovery, it does. And you, you, um, you know, when you're better nourished, you're less preoccupied with food, um, you're less obsessional, and you're, you're much better able to get on with other aspects of your life. Um, and how can you help reintroduce somebody living with an eating disorder back into the workplace? Um, I suppose they need to be well first, but then there are... Um, agencies that do support people that have been out of the workplace for a while and maybe agencies like the National Learning Network or um, the Employment Support Services do you know so 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 people can do kind of rehabilitative courses to get them used to kind of that sort of arena <coughs> again and um, it's, it's quite a broad question but I hope, hope I've given some idea thank you very much okay um I suppose our team like to think we do some things well in the in in terms of addressing the problem of helping people to recover. One thing we're not good at, though, is we're not good at predicting who will do well in the program. And I suppose there have we have realised now that um, it's very hard to predict that moment when somebody has the the break in the denial and manages to make a breakthrough and break out of that vicious cycle. So I think that's the take home message we'd like to finish with is that, that actually recovery is always possible. There are choices in it, but if you make the choice and pursue it, it is always possible. No matter how severe the eating disorder has been, no matter how long it's been around, it still comes down to making that breakthrough in terms of overcoming the denial, accepting that there is an eating disorder, and finding out how do you break out of the cycle. Okay, safe home.